when you hear there's a murder, it can frighten people. I was so shocked that something like that would happen in a lovely village like this. They seemed to be happy with each other, everyone loved her, and she got along with everyone. There were concerns about her welfare. The alarm bells were raised. They had heard things happening, shouting, fights. It was weird. It's as if he was trying to tell us something. He went off on what can only be described as a drink and, and drugs binge. Ultimately, it led to the tragic death of a lovely, caring wife. A lovely woman who was taken away from us by a horrible, sadistic man. Situated in the stunning, rolling wolds of North Lincolnshire lies the peaceful village of Whirlaby. I've lived in Whirlaby for 48 years. It's a really nice, quiet village. Everybody seems to know everybody. We get on really well. Last year, we won the best kept village. It's a nice little village, plenty of activities, plenty going on. It's so quiet, it's a little rural idyll, if you like. It's like going back in time living here. There's very little crime, it's beautiful, and it's a wonderful place to live for young families or retired people, and we've got all of them here. Friendly community, everybody seems like pretty much OK, you know. There's a lot of people who uh, help each other, so there is a, quite a lot of good community atmosphere. And it, it, it is a lovely place to live. It's really nice. So it's the ideal place for Ian Hamer and wife Joanne to set up home. We're fairly new to the village. I think they've only been here about five years in total. I think I met her once. She seemed a really nice lady. Joanne, in particular, seems to throw herself into village life. Joanne was liked by everyone on the road. Outgoing, always out on the streets, or speaking to each other. Ian, you would never see. He would be in his home quite a lot. Joanne, complete opposite. Everyone loved her, a really welcoming woman, and she got along with everyone. And so people wanted to open up to her, um, and that's why she, I think she quickly integrated into Worthby and loved living there. Joanne also has a successful career at the local council where she manages their healthy lifestyle service. After six years there, she's risen to become the public face of their healthy living campaigns. She was quite a bright, some would say a brilliant person who had a quite substantial job working with the local authority and really independently minded in some respects. Just a lovely woman who did wonders for the council. Everyone loved her at the council, and no one had a bad word to say about her. Ian Hamer, Joanne's husband of 27 years, works as a self-employed business consultant. He worked in many businesses and earning money here and there. And to sustain a reasonable living, you know, he had a nice, nice place in Worldly, quite an expensive area to live in. So he must have, must have been doing OK in his profession, I guess. They seemed to be happy with each other. Friends and family said that they was a good couple for the large part. Married a long time, nice family, three kids. It was all seemingly going well. But what seems like an idyllic life is about to change. Humberside Police, what's your emergency? Humberside Police are called after Joanne fails to turn up for work. Her elderly mother has also been trying to reach her to no avail. They did speak most days, if not every day, because her mother was very ill as well. And uh, Joanne used to help to look after her. And that raised sufficient concern for her to ring the police. There were concerns about her welfare. The alarm bells were, were raised. And a concern for welfare incident was generated, which resulted in the police attending. <laughs> police make their way over to the family home. When they knock on the door, there's no answer. So the officers break in. When they search through the house, nothing could prepare police for what they find in the master bedroom. Joanne 
Joanne Hamers lying lifeless on her bed. Medical professionals will have been called immediately. You know, monitors would have been placed on to see if there's any signs of heart trace or anything, uh, any chance whatsoever that resuscitation could take place. They had discovered she was dead. It's apparent she'd been killed from the scene, the way she was left. And there was blood at the scene as well. Joanne had been strangled by her dressing gown cord. That's when we're looking at securing evidence within that scene. Teams of police descend on Whirlaby. The quiet village has never seen anything like it. When I came back from work, there was police cars, vans, and I'm saying, what's going on? What the hell all the police doing here? Something happened. And then when I got home and my daughter texted me and said she'd seen it, that uh, there'd been a murder. I just couldn't believe it. I was so shocked that something like that would happen in a lovely village like this. You don't expect it. As word spreads fast through the neighbourhood, the local newspaper gets wind of an incident in Whirlaby. Reporter Charlie Wilson heads to the scene. So you're like, OK, we've got a big story. Let's get there first, let's, let's be quick, let's be first. So we got down there, we were the first people there. Very quickly, it was evident this could be a very serious, scary incident. I've never reported on a murder before. That's the first time that's happened to me. Um, so it was a case of doing it really delicately, respectfully, and just trying to build up what happened, really. Soon, the news is spreading beyond the boundaries of the village. Maybe an hour later, you get the likes of ITV, BBC, Sky coming down, and that's when it was like, whoa, OK, people out on the road, like, wondering what's going on. Yeah, everyone was shocked to see the amount of media attention. You just don't get this sort of thing in these sort of villages. Yeah, I was quite shocked, really. You would never think that something would happen in a small community like this. I couldn't believe it. Everybody was shocked. It didn't seem right something like that would happen here. You hear about it in cities, but in a little quiet Lincolnshire village, you just don't expect it at all. Joanne's family are left devastated by the news, and her colleagues at work are also reeling. Truly sad. I spoke to a few of them. They were just in pieces, of course it would be. Their colleague who they loved dearly, and they really did love her, it was tough for him, it was very tough. And it dawns on Joe's village that there's a killer living in their midst. I think some people were a little bit upset. They were locking the doors a bit more quickly. I think the first reaction is alarm, because when you hear there's a murder, but you don't know the circumstances, and it can frighten people into thinking we've got a killer at large who's going to cause more trouble. You'd be quite fearful about what it could mean and what the implications for the future are. It was very awful to hear that it had happened in our village. It's frightening. It really is. With fear spreading quickly throughout the village, Humberside Police needs to work fast to establish who committed this horrendous crime. And first, they look at Joanne's home life. This marriage on the surface, to all intents and purposes, would have looked like a stable, normal marriage without too many problems. The reality was uh, quite different. What I heard was that their marriage wasn't great by the people on the road who lived there because they had heard Things happening, um, let's just say, um, whether it be shouting, fights. It turns out Joanne and Ian had recently had a trial separation, but then Joanne decided to return to the family home. Joanne Hamer had um, sought to see if she could give the relationship one last, one last chance. This was part of her trying to make the relationship work. This new information puts husband Ian in a new light. Maybe Joanne tried to keep certain things to herself to hide what was really going on at the home to save her marriage. With Ian Hamer nowhere to be seen, police suspicions are starting to build. 
We do know in this particular case that a neighbour had reported an argument in the, in the morning uh, between them. I spoke to the woman who heard the incident at around 4 o'clock in the morning, around that time. She had heard screams, shouts for help. And then the argument ceased. Police launch an urgent public appeal to help them find Joanne's husband. They need to track down Ian Hamer and fast. In the quiet Lincolnshire village of Whirlaby, police have launched a murder hunt. Mother of three, Joanne Hamer, has been found strangled in her bed. Husband Ian has mysteriously disappeared since a row reported by neighbours in the early hours of the morning. And this doesn't seem to be the first either. I guess people on the road had heard these things where it really went bad to say the least. None of the neighbours who I spoke to liked him at all. With Ian Hamer now under suspicion, Humberside police make an urgent appeal for his whereabouts. They release the details of his car, a white BMW 5 Series. They also warn the public not to approach him. Once a decision had been made by the senior investigating officer that Ian Hamer was a suspect uh, for this crime, then a manhunt would have taken place. They don't know at the moment where he is, but there would be certain fast-track actions raised to secure his arrest. You know, uh, checks with family and friends. Where does he usually go to? Where does he work? Checks with hospitals as well. If he's got a mobile phone, has he made any calls? We may be able to sell site to where he's located and instigate an area search. He's clearly got use of a vehicle in this case. So, you know, we've been putting the vehicle details onto the uh, automatic number plate uh, recognition, the AMPR system. And as soon as that vehicle passes an AMPR camera, then that will send an alert to the police. All these inquiries made to trace and arrest Ian Hamer. He clearly was the last person with her and had disappeared from the scene. So the investigation then was focusing on building that picture around what had happened between them. And then going further back, what had happened between them, not just on that night, but also in the period leading up to this. Detectives put Ian Hamer under the microscope. The picture that emerged from witnesses was of somebody who was supremely self-assured, self-confident, and superficially um, was, or at least on the face of it, was somebody who was um, quite engaging and interesting. But those same people always spoke about, the, the more they got to know him, there was, appeared to be another side to him. And they also described how, over time, he could present as being very self-interested and, I suppose, conceited. So there was somebody who could, uh, when he wanted to present, in a way which was superficially attractive. But the more people got to know him, the more there was to him which was unattractive in terms of him being controlling, perhaps aggressive. And after speaking to Joanne's family and friends, it turns out Hamer has a chequered history. There have been a number of previous reports made indicating domestic violence. You know, he was reported to have ripped up her wedding dress. Those reports of him tearing up a teddy bear, which was sentimental to her. You know, this is uh, really significant in a case such as this. The police have been called out on many occasions, but, but as is so often the case, they weren't really ever progressed. Part of that was because of um, the approach of the family to try and manage what was happening within the family. The personality of Joanne Hamer was, tra tragically, to try and make it work at all times. 
when you're married to someone for so long, you want to, you know, make things work. And she shouldn't be far, wrongly far back for wanting to make her marriage with her husband of 27 years and three children work. It's just that he was so far gone and so far twisted. There are a number of occasions where uh, she left him, but he managed to persuade her to come back. And I've investigated, sadly, domestic homicides where controlling and abusive husbands have tried to isolate their wives. And we know that Hamer did this and, uh, you know, dissuading her from contact with family and friends. In 2013, Police discover this came to a head when Ian Hamer started divorce proceedings, blaming the involvement of Joanne's mother in their relationship. So, you know, he, he was uh, antagonistic towards his wife's relationship with her own mother. So he was all about controlling and being abusive uh, towards his wife and, and driving a wedge between her and family and friends. And it just shows this uh, controlling and coercive and uh, bullying and domineering nature of Ian Hamer towards his wife within that relationship. And that isn't uncommon in domestic homicide cases, sadly. It seems the couple reconciled, but then in 2017, things take another turn for the worst. Ian Hamer starts accusing his wife of having affairs. Police analysis of Joanne's smartphone reveals something even more sinister. Around this time, Hamer hacked into his wife's handset so he could track her every move. He would apparently follow her to work, follow her on nights out with friends, monitor her phone and where she was going, where she was at. Wouldn't let her do certain things, apparently, wear certain things, and she was a bit closed off. This is how uh, obsessive he was about his wife and his, uh, his jealousy and his thought processes that he wanted to accuse her of extramarital affairs. And a probe of the couple's bank accounts shows Ian's disturbingly tight grip over her purse strings. He was keeping money from her, basically, like, I guess sort of giving her an allowance of what to spend and what she could do, and wouldn't let her go out at certain times. All the bearings of, you know, a toxic, horrible relationship. Obviously, she felt trapped. She felt like she needed to get out, and she tried to do that. Um, he wouldn't let her. In the weeks before her death, Joanne had moved out and was considering buying a property. But she was persuaded by Ian to return, two days before her murder. It was on this day, the 4th of May, that police background checks reveal a disturbing incident. Ian Hamer had been arrested for drink driving. As well as being a controlling abusive towards his wife, he seemed to be losing control of his own life in some respects. He was drinking more heavily. So there's a clear pattern there of his own destructive behaviour escalating within himself and particularly uh, abusing alcohol as part of that process. Investigators discover it's not only drink that's fueling Hamer's abusive behaviour. He had a cocaine problem. That had become prevalent in his life over the last two or three years, and that became worse and worse and worse. When he picked up this addiction, maybe his personality changed because of that and his health mental and physical deteriorated. Businessman Ian Hamer's respectable lifestyle is now questionable. And when they learn what he did in the hours following the estimated time of Joanne's murder, they're convinced they have the right man. Soon after that last blazing row reported by neighbours, Joanne's mother said she had an unsettling phone call with her son-in-law. When family members tried to contact her the following morning, he told them that Joanne Hamer couldn't speak to them because she was unwell, and as he framed it, she had a, a sore throat. Chillingly, police believe Joanne was already dead when Hamer made that calculating comment. Just, like, sick. 
like you strangle her and then you got to tell her mom but she can't come because she's got a bad throat like sadistic like horrible when you hear that it's just like i don't know what to say horrible and it appears hamer used the same story again his son had attended at the the marital home at a time when Joanne Hamer was probably dead, and th that's when he first introduced that concept of her having a sore throat when he knew she'd been strangled and she was probably dead. He also told his son as well when he w was at the house to go and buy some lozenges because uh, his mother was sleeping, she had a bad throat, uh, knowing full well that he'd, uh, he'd strangled her, which he, now we know what happened. It was particularly chilling in this case to say that she'd got a bad throat. I mean, how callous is that? And therefore the question is whether it was that him being cruel or was it him buying time? This cunning ploy tells police they have a calculating killer on the run who wants to stay one step ahead of them. But it's only a matter of time before a false move by Hamer would reveal where he's hiding. Burlaby, North Lincolnshire. Murder suspect Ian Hamer is on the run after his wife Joanne is found strangled in their bedroom. And this is a man who, at this point, everyone in the, in the area is looking for and knows that, OK, this is a manhunt. As police cast their search net wider, reporters like Charlie Wilson are on the ground looking for leads. Suddenly, that morning, there's word from nearby Barton-upon-Humber. We heard news that there might be an incident in Barton where he might be. And so we went to Barton and then heard he was in a, he was seen near a pub. Barton is about eight miles away and it's quite big, quite a lot of people, so it's the, it's the obvious place to go. You've got the Humber Bridge. From the Humber Bridge, you've got the whole of Yorkshire to go into and disappear. It would be a logical place to go. A resident next to one of the town's car parks spots a man behaving erratically. He was basically swaying around in the car park, uh, making noise, acting strange. Not realising it's Humberside Police's most wanted, Ian Hamer. The woman calls 999 to report a disturbance. I think she reported that he was on spice and shouting. Um, obviously, he was actually drunk, intoxicated, or whatever he was on. Um, he would wander around the car park, shout. A lone patrol officer heads to the car park to move this wild drunkard on. Police basically just found a man shouting and being strange. And realised this is Ian Hamer. Arrested him straight away. The officer single-handedly tackles Hamer to the floor, then restrains him whilst he radios for assistance. I have to say the actions of the officer that arrested him were, were exemplary, you know, real bravery shown in tackling this individual. And when he was arrested, you know, the actual had to detain him. This is a rural force. It's not an inner city force with the same number of resources. Meanwhile, roving reporter Charlie Wilson is close by. Suddenly, he's alerted to the breaking news. A woman sent me a picture of a man on the floor being sat on by a police officer. OK, that's our man. So we know exactly where it is. I'm actually um, at a shop getting a drink of Lucozade. Uh, run around with my Lucozade in hand. So I arrive at the scene. Ian Hamer is being sat on by a lone police officer waiting for his um, fellow officers to come. So to come round the corner and see a police officer sat on who we believe is Ian Hamer was just wild, yeah. After struggling to contain Hamer for nearly five minutes alone, backup finally arrives for the officer. 
Bay must have came, got half a second after I came around the corner, and then police swarmed on him, got him away, and sort of like ushered us away. Clearly intoxicated, drunk or drugs or both, not in his right frame of mind, in the clothes that he's wearing the night before. We get him up, handcuff him, escort him to the back of the van. Meanwhile, news of an arrest for Joanne's murder filters back to her village of Whirlaby. Residents can now breathe a sigh of relief. I was just pleased he'd been caught for the crime, but to then find out that it was her husband, it was a real shock. Detectives start to piece together what Haim has been up to in the last 24 hours since fleeing the murder scene. He went off on, on what can only be described as uh, a drink and, and drugs binge. We know that from the inquiries that were made. Uh, laughing and joking, you know, certainly no signs of remorse or distress. Bar owner Pauline Dickinson had reported serving Ian Hamer. But when he arrived on her premises, she had no idea he was on the run. He came in the pub around half past five, Never seen him before. Asked for a pint of carling. He got his pint of carling and went and sat down out the way of everybody. Next, Hamer returns to the bar and starts to hit the spirits. Soon the conversation heads in a strange and unsettling direction. Put the tequila on the bar and he literally looked either side of himself, leant over the bar and said to me, why did the Mexican push his wife off the cliff? So I did the same as he did, looked either the side and said, to kill her? He went, no, oh, you know it. I said, yeah, I do. He paid for his drinks, went and sat down. He came back to the bar 10, 15 minutes later and stood there. Then Pauline clocked something sinister. He hid his arm behind, but I'd already seen that he'd got scratches. I don't know which way, it was just you could see scratches on his wrist. One of our customers noticed scratches as well and went, oh, he's one of those who's been harming. One of my customers said to him, hey up mate, what are you doing in here? Are you from here? He says, no, he said, I'm not from here. I'm just going through a breakup with my wife. So he went, oh, right, sorry to hear that, mate. He went, yeah, she's taken me for all my money. So he said, don't be sad. He said, have another drink. So one of the customers bought him a drink. Over the next few hours, Heyman knocks back the drinks, laughing and joking with the regulars. So he did about two more jokes to the point where the customer said, no wonder your wife left you. If you've got jokes like that, he went, that's maybe why she's gone then. Quite significantly as well, uh, he was seen to take his wedding ring off. So he knows what's happened. He knows that his wife's dead. So, you know, that's quite a, a significant gesture. And that was done, you know, merely hours after he'd actually killed his wife. And it just shows the kind of individual that he is. Some of the pub regulars seem unsettled by this customer they've never seen before, who has struck up conversation with another man at the bar. My two regulars, they finished their drinks. I went, right, you two go in. I went, no, nah, we're not going. They said, why? We're not leaving you with them two. We don't know the other guys, so we're not leaving you with them. I went, no, oh, don't be daft. What are these two going to do to me? I'll soon have them out the door, don't worry. So they went, no, we're staying. So they stayed. Soon the bar's regulars saw glimpses of another side to their joking acquaintance, who's going by a false name, Sebastian. So we played pool against one of my regulars, who is a really good player. And during the game, there was, there was banter going on. But right at the end, when the customer knew he was going to win. He picked up the broom that I'd got out ready to clean up and potted black with 
the broom. Which Sebastian said, that is so disrespectful to do that. He said, I don't think so, I still won. I don't think he was very pleased and finished his drink and he did actually walk out. You just get a feeling about people. You know if they're not OK. I don't think he would have done any harm, but who knows? Next morning, Pauline's alerted to the terrifying news on Facebook that the customer she had served the night before isn't called Sebastian, but Ian Hamer. And he's wanted by police for murder. My reaction was, oh, my God. So I phoned a policeman that I know, and within five, ten minutes, I think, they'd got him. Soon, the joke Hamer told Pauline about a man pushing his wife off a cliff takes on a sinister new meaning. It was weird, but they were just jokes, like, you know what, a kid would come home and tell you jokes, but it's not until the following day. And I actually thought to myself, it's as if he was trying to tell us something. I, I don't know. It's not until the following day that things fell into place. Despite his intoxicated state, Ian Hamer engages with the police at the point of his arrest. He says something like, it wasn't murder, it was manslaughter. Something along those lines. I heard the word manslaughter. He did make a very significant statement, an unsolicited comment to the officer indicating that he wasn't guilty of murder. It was diminished responsibility, so he was already offering up a statutory defence uh, to murder. After 24 hours on the run, Ian Hamer has been arrested in North Lincolnshire on suspicion of murder. Just hours after killing his wife, Joanne, Hamer was spotted in Pauline's bar, just seven miles away from the crime scene. You just would not have thought he'd actually killed his wife and just come blazingly into a bar a few miles away having a drink. When you hear them things, it's like, really? Could you be so cold-blooded and heartless? When police take him in for questioning, Hamer repeats his claims that he committed manslaughter due to mental illness. But one throwaway comment soon after his arrest suggests this is a cunning ploy to reduce any impending prison sentence. And what was a telling piece of evidence? He said to the officers who were tending to him, this was manslaughter, and asked this question, have we done enough for diminished responsibility? This was a man who was trying to present a picture of being so mentally unwell that he was not to be held fully responsible for his wife's death. This is clearly somebody who's a very manipulative, selfish individual. And uh, his response, he's already uh, trying to escape justice for his crime uh, as soon as he's arrested. And he's clearly given a great deal of thought to that uh, before his arrest. And Ian Hamer clearly only cares about one person, and that's Ian Hamer. In spite of Hamer's claims, he's charged with his wife's murder. Months later, mental health experts are brought in to provide a true picture of Hamer's state of mind. After his arrest, he was subsequently interviewed by two psychiatrists to explore uh, whether there were any uh, mental illness elements that would lead to diminished responsibility. They ask him probing questions about his relationship with wife Joanne. He began to present what was ultimately going to be his defense. He accepted he had killed her. 
but in the context where he said he, he didn't want to do it, and used a phrase that it was a, some sort of psychotic episode. Then Hamer starts to go on the offensive, claiming he is the real victim in the abusive marriage. Ian Hamer claimed that his wife had taunted him to say that their children weren't his. He made a slur on his wife's character, saying she was engaged in extramarital affairs. There's no evidence of this. He would say that she would see other people, that she would be on dating apps and she would find other men more attractive than him. And anyone who knew Joanne knows that that's just completely laughable and joke. She's the most, was the most loyal woman you could meet. Just sort of making up excuses in his head, I guess, to find ways and motives to do what he did. Then his claims turn even more extreme. He made claim that he was himself a victim of domestic abuse. You know, he claims that she hit him over the head with a shoe. We've got no information about any injury or certainly any serious injury to him. He claims she threw a phone at him. Again, there was no injury that we're aware of uh, to support that. This was all seen as a tissue of lies. And clearly the people that knew Joanne had not uh, seen any evidence of this whatsoever. And the only person who could suggest that this had taken place was Ian Hamer himself. But soon, the psychiatrists start to uncover Hamer's true colours. What was actually found by two psychiatrists, one diagnosed him with morbid jealousy and one with obsessive jealousy. But clearly, there wasn't an element of diminished responsibility for his actions. From the facts we know about the case and his behaviour and his actions, come as no surprise, because uh, we can see uh, the, the way that he jealously controlled uh, his wife's movements and behaviour, you know, a, a real control in nature. And when detectives scan Hamer's smartphone, the picture he painted as the victim starts to crumble. Just days before Joanne's murder, they find texts he sent to another woman promising jewellery. Things he was doing, he would accuse her for. He was seeing other women that came out. Uh, he was on dating apps. He would accuse her of the things that he was doing exa exactly the same. We do know that Ian Hamer had affairs, he had one night stands, and he accused his wife of the same. There's no evidence to suggest that that was the case. But investigators are blown away when they uncover the name Hamer uses on his dating profile. It sounds strikingly familiar. He'd use a fake name, Sebastian, apparently. He would use women wherever he was going to maybe go out on these dates and meet people. And yeah, to use a fake name, like you're obviously up to something that's not good. Fifteen months after Joanne's murder, husband Ian Hamer is finally put on trial at Hull Crown Court. He pleads guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility but the prosecution sets out the case for cold-blooded murder. So it was a consideration for the jury uh, whether that was a man demonstrating uh, real symptoms of mental illness or whether it was somebody using any illness to formulate a defence. The court is told the torrid details of the abuse Hamer inflicted on his wife. The question that was raised with the jury is whether or not, by the time of the killing, he, in effect, wanted to get rid of his wife so he could move on, but he needed control of that situation, and that's how we presented the, the, the case. As the trial progresses, even Hamer's own children take to the stand against their own father to describe the abuse suffered in their own home. One of them spoke of being aware of that from a very young age, had been become increasingly toxic and abusive. You then see the horrible human side of this because they're being required to give evidence against one of their parents and in circumstances where they've lost the other one. 
And for them, there is, there's no good outcome to any of this. Following a heart-wrenching three-week trial, the jury retires to consider their verdict. The verdict of the jury was that Ian Hamer was guilty of murder. Therefore, they rejected that idea that his mental state was such that he was not able to exercise proper judgment and control. He designed everything, including his response to the arresting officer, to make out that this was the case, that it was diminished responsibility. Thankfully, the, the jury didn't buy that, and they saw through um, Ian Hamer's excuses for what they were, just excuses. Hamer's jailed for life with a minimum of 22 years. At the time of sentencing, the judge takes into account the years of domestic violence Joanne suffered at the hands of her husband and his abusive control over her finances. The judge actually commented that he believed that one of the main motives in this case was he was afraid if the relationship ended that he would lose a significant amount of money. Uh, money to which uh, Joanne in the uh, law of England and Wales was entitled to. That those were the family finances that should have been split accordingly. He didn't want that to happen, and he murdered his wife as a result. Kill someone, go out drinking, using drugs, and joking about what he did. He obviously deserves to be locked away for the rest of his life, and I'm glad that's the case. Killers like Ian Hamer are so manipulative and so self-centred, and ultimately it led to the tragic death of a lovely, caring wife. But there's only one person to blame for that, and it's Ian Hamer. Years later, the sadness of the case is still felt by those in the quiet Lincolnshire village of Whirlaby. There'll always be some weird, I guess, aura for people still living there, knowing that what happened in that house happened, the worst crime you can commit. And it, I guess it opened a lot of people's eyes to thinking that this can happen anywhere. I feel so sorry for the family. You know, one act like that and it's wrecked the family. And it's something they'll have to live with, I'm afraid to say, and it's not very nice. Ian Hamer is definitely a master manipulator. A lovely woman who was taken away from us by a horrible, sadistic man. It was something you never expected to report on, especially in Whirlaby. I never met Joanne. But I know that she's a lovely woman. I know, but, you know, she deserved a lot better than Ian Hamer. Truly sad story, a sad situation. All you can do is just hope the best for the Hamer family, for the children. Just an awful situation, which Ian Hamer will spend the rest of his life in jail for. <laughs>